Last week in our scripture text, we read about one of Jesus's very first healing miracles and how after that, everybody in town heard about it. So then everybody in town brought all of their sick folks to Jesus, hoping that he would heal them too. So everywhere that Jesus went, crowds surrounded him. That's good. Unless he happens to be speaking in a small house and the crowd won't let you in. That is the situation in our text today. Here is a reading from the gospel according to Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. Hear now the word of the Lord. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus and, after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. May God bless the reading of this holy word today. So this is a great story, maybe one that you've heard many times before. It starts at the very beginning with Jesus going back to the town of Capernaum, which was like his home base during his ministry. He would go out to different lands, then come back to Capernaum. It probably took place here in Simon Peter's family's house, which definitely would not have been big enough to accommodate a big crowd. And notice that now Jesus isn't just helping sick people to feel better. Now that he's gotten their attention, what does verse 2 say that he's doing? It says he's preaching the word of God to them. Now they must be ready to hear it, ready to listen and accept the truth of God's good news, that they are loved and can be forgiven. So this is great. Jesus is doing his thing. He's preaching and healing, and the people are in awe of him. So many want to see him that it says there was no room left, not even outside the door of the house. It's standing room only. So that's good. Unless you're not able to stand, then it would be hard to reach Jesus. And that brings us to the paralyzed man in our story. We don't know if he was just paralyzed from the waist down, like if he was born with a disability or contracted a disease, or if he had received an injury that made him a quadriplegic from the neck down. We don't know. We just know that he is paralyzed in some way and cannot make it to see Jesus on his own. His friends carry him there. And these were the days long before wheelchairs or any accessibility assistance, when no buildings were made to be handicap accessible. So the friends have to improvise. They are determined. They're carrying the man across town on his mat, probably carrying him as if he were on a stretcher. 
and they can't squeeze into the house because of the tight crowd. So what are they going to do? I bet one of them had a light bulb moment, an epiphany, and he says, hang on a second, I've got an idea. We're going to the roof. Now, houses back then usually had outside steps that led up on top of the roofs, so that's probably what the men walked up that day. Most of the roofs were flat with a framework of wooden beams that would have been filled with mud and straw, maybe some vines, and whatever could keep the rain out. So it wouldn't have been too hard if you really worked at it, put your back into it, to dig through that thatch and that mesh of the roof, especially if you've got four strong guys working on it, like we do in this story. And the ceilings back then were not very tall. They were pretty low to the ground compared to houses now. So once the hole was dug open, all the men could have looked down and they would have been right there up in everybody's business, just looking, staring at each other through that hole. I can only assume the crowd there huddled in the house looked up in stunned confusion and thought, what are those guys doing? They don't stop digging, though. They keep digging wider and wider a hole until it's big enough for their friend to get through. And they can lower him slowly down so finally he can meet Jesus. Awesome. What a good story. Good for them. Everyone needs friends like that or just to know people who are willing to help to do that kind of thing. If there is someone who wants to meet Jesus today or just connect with the church today, like the friends back then, we should do whatever it takes to help them get there. In the past, that involved things like a good transportation ministry to pick up folks who didn't have rides, or installing elevators, renovation projects that churches had to do so that any person, no matter what their level of physical ability, could access every space in the church easily. Our own church did that here about 10 years ago when we installed an elevator. It was a big project and it was expensive, and we're still paying off the costs of that master plan renovation program, but it was worth it. It was worth it for any person who comes into our church to know that every place in this God's house is available to them, that they are welcomed here and supported and not left out, not left outside. Since less and less people are interested in going to church at all these days, if a new person does want to come, then we should do whatever we can to help make it happen. If somebody wants to worship here, then it is our responsibility to get all the obstacles out of the way so that they can connect with the body of Christ. What's been really interesting over the past year is how some of those needs have changed and shifted during the pandemic. When it wasn't safe for crowds of people to be in a room for a service, everything switched to virtual like we are now. So that really important value of accessibility was no longer so much about elevators and physical access, but about screens and digital access. So again, when that happened, we did whatever we had to do to help everyone stay connected with the body of Christ here. Broadcasting worship so that you all could watch from home? Yes, but what if folks don't have internet access in their home. Okay, well, we'll make DVD recordings available of the worship service. Okay, but what about folks who don't have a DVD player? Okay, well, we will make worship available on a telephone number service 
so that they can dial in and listen on their landline phone. Whatever we have to do, we worked to figure it out because that is important. Even if just one person uses something, some service, or needs something, it is worth it for us to do to figure out how they can connect with the body of Christ. Now, fortunately, we haven't had to dig through any of our ceilings like the men in our story. But a few months ago, Gary and Bill did dig through the floor a little bit right here down at the front when all of our worship streaming equipment was right here on the front pew with the camera and the laptop and the table and everything, and we needed an outlet. So Gary and Bill dug a little hole and installed an outlet in one afternoon, which was very helpful. And there were a lot of late evenings and hours spent here in the sanctuary when it was dark outside, figuring things out, running tests by me and David and Tim, hours spent figuring out new setups and technology. We've made Jarrett sit in weird places during worship and stand in weird places and carry a camera around for new kinds of worship experiences whatever it takes to help you or anyone see and hear and fully participate in the worship of God. That is important. Now, yes, sometimes it does take us a few weeks to dig around and figure out how to make that opening available and all the things that we have to do. So as the weeks go by, the, the, the access will get a little bigger and better but we don't give up and we keep working on it. And I'm so appreciative of all the people who have worked on it and all the folks who are right behind the camera that you are watching this through, making it possible for you to participate in worship today. We appreciate their efforts so much. Just like with the paralyzed man's friends that day, it might've taken them a while and a lot of sweat equity they might have poured out. But they dug through that roof. They lowered the man down slowly and carefully, and they got him to Jesus' presence. The one person who could heal him. Awesome. So, what does Jesus do? Does Jesus fix his legs so he can jump up straight away? No. No. Jesus doesn't heal him physically then. Instead, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Wait, what? That's not what they came for. That's not why they carried their friend all across town, up a flight of stairs, down through a hole in a roof they just dug. They came so he could get fixed. That's why they're there. That's why they went to all that effort. They were probably watching this moment expectantly from up on top of the roof, through the hole they had just dug, looking at Jesus as the sweat continued to drip off their faces from the work and the strain. Their hands were probably dirty from the mud and the branches that were inside the roof they had just pulled out. They were probably panting and excited, thinking, we did it. We got him to the healer. Now the healer is going to heal him so he can run and play with us like he has dreamed for so long. But the healer just says, your sins are forgiven. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the friends shouted out loud, Hey, come on, man, fix his legs already. We didn't come here so he could get forgiven. He just wants to walk. Can you do it or not? They might not have said it out loud, but I bet they thought that in their heads. But what about the paralyzed man? I wonder what he thought when Jesus spoke. Was he disappointed at first? He was certainly probably surprised. All that trouble so he could get healed, and the healer says, your sins are forgiven. Anybody can say that. But when this Jesus guy says it, it sounds a little different. It feels different. When Jesus says it, 
It's like it's real, like it really happened, like he really is forgiven and cleansed on the inside. The truth of that probably pierced the man's heart. Maybe he was moved to tears when he heard it and when he felt it in his soul. Because back then, Jews and religious people thought that if something bad happened to you, it was either your fault or your parents' fault. So if you got sick or hurt, it must have been because you sinned or did something wrong, so you were punished. Jesus' disciples thought that. The religious teachers thought that. So if a baby was born different, maybe disabled in some way, people assumed that either the baby had sin in its heart somehow, or its parents had done some wrong sin and it had passed down to the child. That must be the explanation, they thought. So this man would have lived with that stigma every day of his life. It wasn't simply that he couldn't walk around, that his legs were somehow broken, but that he was told that he himself was messed up on the inside that he himself was broken, that he didn't deserve to be whole or happy or to walk through life like normal people. So Jesus wants him to know none of that is true. You are forgiven and you are loved and you can be whole. Wow. Again, that is amazing. That's worth celebrating. I bet it did move the man to tears after he had struggled on the inside for so long. But unfortunately, not everyone in the crowded house that day was celebrating or was pleased. Verse 6 says that some teachers of the law were sitting there I guess they insisted that they got to sit down in the chairs while everyone else was standing. And back then, they were the experts on all the religious rules of the Old Testament. They were the Pharisees who felt they knew everything about how to live and how to follow God. And they didn't like people who thought differently, which is why they never liked Jesus at all from the very beginning. Jesus was doing new things and saying new things, which the Pharisees didn't like a new way to live and worship that updated people's understanding of how God works. Like a disabled man could be fully spiritually cleansed and restored and purified. Hmm, that sounds like crazy talk to them. Certainly no one would have the authority to declare that, surely. No matter what Jesus does, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law always got upset with him. In this story, they don't have time to complain out loud like they usually do because Jesus knows what they're thinking on the inside and calls them out on it. Verses 9 through 10 can be a little tricky to understand, but it's like Jesus' way of saying, okay, you tell me. Which one is easier to do? To just tell somebody that they are forgiven or to tell someone that they can now walk? Because anybody can just say that your sins are forgiven. So here's what I'll do. Jesus says, watch. I'll do the hard one and tell this man that he can stand up and walk just so that you can see and know that I have the power to do both, to heal on the inside and on the out. So, all right, son, go ahead, stand up. You can walk on home now. And it happens. That's when the paralyzed man would have really been shocked. I bet his friends started cheering from up on top of the roof, patting each other on the back as they celebrated when he did stand up, picked up his mat, walked outside. I bet they ran down the stairs skipping every other one. They were so excited 
to jump up together and celebrate with him outside the house. I bet they didn't stop running all afternoon. He was so glad. Those are good friends to have and to know. And they're not just good friends because they went to the effort of carrying him across town, up some stairs and down through a roof. There's a tiny little clue about how good they are in verse five that's easy to miss. After they lowered the man down, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he told the paralyzed man that his sins were forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, not just the man's faith, but his friends too. It was all of their faith together that had amazing results. If it hadn't been for his friends having faith, they never would have carried him, dug a hole, and lowered him down. It took a lot of effort, but because of that, Jesus could see their faith and what they were willing to do for a friend. So, now is the time to think about ourselves, to think about yourself and your friends, the people that you know. How are they doing? Are they plagued by past mistakes? Or do they feel messed up inside, like they don't deserve to connect with God's Holy Spirit, that they don't deserve to be happy or blessed? Do they need to hear that the God of the universe loves them and forgives them and heals them and cleanses them? Well, what are you willing to do to help? We can't force someone to think or accept something, but if there's a person who needs a little help to hear that good news, then you can help. You can help them hear and know God's good news of love and grace and forgiveness. It might be awkward. You might get your hands dirty doing the work and doing the digging. You might work up a sweat as you do some heavy lifting to push, pull, or drag them into God's presence or to get them connected to church. Things might not even pan out exactly the way you thought that they might. But if they can hear God's good news for their life, then your faith will have helped them know forgiveness. And it will help you know forgiveness and healing too. And that is worth doing whatever it takes. Let's pray. Oh God, we confess that we have not always worked to bring others into your loving presence like we could. We confess that we have taken for granted your love and acceptance for us. So let us never forget what a blessing it is to know we are loved and forgiving and forgiven. Let us never forget that you gave us a great commission to help others know and hear and feel that love as well. It is truly a transforming blessing to know the simple, infinite truth that we are a child of God, beloved, just as we are. So let us do whatever it takes to help others know that simple, infinite truth as well. Give us the strength and the vision, the heart and the hands and the willingness to get dirty if need be so that more people will know and feel your love, that their hearts may be changed and the world may be changed.